Hey there, Jeff Nelson of VegSource. Thanks for tuning in. Today we are going to be discussing omega-3 fatty acids and whether or not vegans need DHA supplements. While conducting my research for this video, I did some fascinating interviews with a number of top experts in this field. Uh, I didn't just glance through the studies, but actually talked to the experts who did a number of these studies. I wanted to make sure that I could communicate to you accurately what these studies really mean. So one expert that I interviewed, I wish I had recorded it because he is just so super impressive. And he wasn't available right now, uh, but I'm going to catch him in a couple of weeks and do a follow-up with him, and I'm going to do it on video, and then I'm going to post it on my channel. He's the researcher who has done multiple studies uh, about DHA and cancer. Okay, I'm not a dietitian, I'm not a doctor, but I am a health-oriented journalist with, I hope, a finely tuned sense of skepticism. Let me jump to what I concluded. I don't think anyone needs to take DHA, vegans or otherwise, if you're following a healthy lifestyle, which is what we're all doing, right? And I don't recommend that people test omega-3 blood level because the tests are not accepted as being useful or necessary other than by people who are selling DHA. The bottom line, you don't need to be frightened by the DHA scaremongering. And if you're thinking of taking DHA, I would recommend that you run a risk-benefit analysis and take into account a number of studies that suggest that DHA supplements may increase cancer risk in men, and I'm going to talk about that. Here's a brief outline of what's being covered in this video. What is omega-3? How do you get enough omega-3 through your diet? Don't get advice from the supplement business. Don't take DHA information from supplement salesmen or by reading research that's been paid for by the DHA industry. Should you take supplements? No, other than B12. DHA raises cancer risks. So an increasing body of research indicates that DHA may raise cancer risk in men. Brain Shrinkage and DHA Study The study which Dr. Michael Greger uses as the principal reason that he recommends DHA does not justify Dr. Greger's enthusiasm or conclusions. DHA doesn't help CVD or cancer. Omega-3 supplements have been shown to be worthless for preventing heart disease or cancer. Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. The two main reasons people in the vegan community are currently being scared into taking DHA are Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. Top Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's experts at Harvard and other universities who I spoke to, they say that taking DHA supplements for your brain or nervous system is not useful and not recommended. Dr. Furman's DHA supplement article. I question a couple of professors, including a neurology professor from Harvard Medical School, who looked at Dr. Furman's DHA page. He said that Dr. Furman's presentation on that page is biased and looks like just a sales pitch. I'm going to read his full opinion. Do vegans need to be concerned about omega-3? We'll look at the studies. Ask me questions. So I'm going to finish by asking you to post comments and questions, links to DHA studies, anything you'd like me to discuss, and I will make a second video to go through those questions at some point. There's a lot to go over, and it may take a few videos to cover everything to everyone's satisfaction. Okay, what is omega-3? It's an essential fatty acid, a type of polyunsaturated fat that you can only get from your diet. And that's why we call it essential, because your body can't make them. It's essential that you eat them. There are two of these essential fatty acids, an omega-6 fatty acid called linoleic acid, or LA, and omega-3 fatty acid called alpha linoleic acid, ALA. Unlike saturated fat, hydrogenated fat, and trans fat, omega-3 fats have several beneficial roles in the body. They can reduce blood clotting, reduce inflammation, lower triglycerides, enhance immune function, and they appear to play a role in protecting against some cancers. They're necessary for the formation of healthy cell membranes and proper development of the brain and nervous system. Omega-6 is abundant in our food supply, and it's found in fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts, whole grains, and vegetable oils. Omega-3 is not as abundant, but there's enough to meet our needs in a variety of minimally processed plants. Omega-3 can be found in higher concentrations in fish, which of course vegans don't eat, uh, in flax and chia seeds, and in walnuts. You can get plenty of omega-6 fatty acids in your diet. In fact, most people get too much. The main challenge for people who are eating a less than optimal diet is getting enough omega-3s. Now, there's no established recommended daily intake for omega-3, but the Institute of Medicine 
has set an adequate intake of 1.6 grams per day for men and 1.1 grams for women. For those interested, I'm putting a link to a definition of adequate intake in the description below. There's no official optimal blood levels for omega-3. Doctors don't normally track omega-3. It's not considered an important number. Despite what a supplement salesperson might tell you, there's no agreed upon definition of sufficiency or deficiency. The supplement market is unregulated. Uh, companies can make up whatever they want in terms of definitions and rules, and those rules are generally geared towards selling more DHA. Omega-3 deficiencies are virtually unheard of. Hospitals are not packed with people suffering from DHA deficiencies. There have been associations observed between omega-3 levels and some health conditions, but no cause and effect has ever been shown. There's no hard evidence whatsoever that any diseases are shown to be caused by low levels of omega-3. The DHA craze in the vegan community is largely the result of people who want to make money selling it. A healthy whole food diet will give you all the omega-3 you need. If you have any concern at all, you can simply add a tablespoon of ground flaxseed, which all by itself will provide the Institute of Medicine's adequate intake. But here's where it gets a little complicated. Omega-6 and omega-3 are considered short-chain fatty acids. Our bodies can convert short-chain omega-3s to, into two long chain fatty acids called EPA and DHA. This is really the main concern uh, that we're hearing about, that we're not very good at this conversion and we're not making enough EPA and DHA. And this is where the supplement salesmen come in ready to sell us DHA. However, we know that too much omega-6 in the diet competes with the enzymes that convert omega-3s into EPA and DHA. That's why the standard American diet, with all the animal products, saturated fats, and oils overloaded, all rich sources of omega-6, they make for a terrible omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. There's some evidence that we want a omega-6 to omega-3 ratio around 4 to 1 or less for parts omega-6 to one part omega-3. So let's look at some omega-6 to omega-3 ratios for healthy fats like nuts, seeds, and avocados. You can see peanuts, 4,400 to one. That's a super high ratio. Almonds, 1,700 to one. Brazil nuts, 1,100 to one. Sunflower, 384 to one, and so on. Down cashews, 122 to one. Sesame, 56 to one. Pistachios, down to pecans, 20 to one. Avocado, 15 to 1. As you can see, if you eat a diet high or fairly high in fats, even including healthy fats like nuts, avocados, and so on, you may be creating less than the ideal situation to maximize your, ab your body's ability to convert ALA to EPA and DHA. Foods that are good for increasing omega-3 intake are the English walnut, four to one, that's perfect. Flaxseed, one to four, even more omega-3. Chia seed, one to three. If you eat a lot of nuts other than English walnuts and you're eating a lot of avocado, you may end up with a high omega-6 to three ratio, which could interfere with your conversion rates. If you're eating peanuts or almonds or Brazil nuts, just don't overdo it. Obviously, even cashews and sunflowers are pretty high. If you're just having an ounce of cashews, that's only like 150 calories. So that's not a huge percentage of your calories. That's no big deal. Bottom line, if you want to maximize your ability to convert ALA to EPA and DHA, make sure you get enough ALA by eating a healthy, low-fat, minimally processed, whole food plant-based diet, and maybe a tablespoon of ground flax now and then, limiting your intake of foods that are high in fat and high in omega-6, and live healthy. You're gonna get adequate omega-3s and not too many omega-6s, and a much more favorable omega-6 to three ratio and you're good, you know, forget about it. This has been known for a long time. Here's a study that proves it. Total fat intake modifies plasma fatty acid composition in humans. And it reads, the low fat diet was associated with significantly greater total omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA levels in plasma phospholipid fatty acids and cholesterol esters. Consumption of a low-fat diet alters fatty acid patterns in a manner similar to that observed with feeding omega-3 long-chain fatty acids. This change is likely related to decreased competition for the enzymes of elongation and desaturation with reduced total intake of omega-6 
favoring elongation and desaturization of available omega-3 fatty acids. We know too much omega-6 in your diet can compete with the enzymes that convert omega-3s to EPA and DHA. And that's why the standard American diet with all the animal products and saturated fats and oils overloaded, which are all rich sources of omega-6, it makes for a terrible omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. For those who really want to understand the biochemistry of omega-3s, omega-6s, DHA, EPA, and all of that, you're probably going to be put to sleep by it. But I'm putting a link in the description to a good article by a dietitian if you're really interested in the nitty-gritty. Now, I'm going to recommend that when considering taking supplements, don't go to someone who is selling them. Don't read the research uh, of an online supplement business. Their information is most likely biased. The research is being exploited to sell you a product that you probably don't need. Sites like Dr. Mercola with big supplement stores, they've got disclaimers like this. These statements have not been evaluated by FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Another supplement site, drfirman.com, it has the same disclaimer and goes further. All information provided on this website is for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for advice from your physician or other healthcare professional. You should not use the information on this website for diagnosis or treatment of any health problem. This disclaimer is to protect them in case you buy a supplement on their advice and it doesn't work for you or something goes wrong for you. So I think the problem with supplement sales sites is that they might tend to tout the potential benefits of DHA and maybe even exaggerate them while omitting information about the possible risks. Be aware that there's a lot of commercial research from supplement companies which are as cloaked as you know, unbiased research. It's the basic problem of commercial science. Here's an example with a DHA study. DHA supplementation improved both memory and reaction time in healthy young adults, a randomized controlled trial. The study says it was funded by a university research fund and the DHA supplement was donated by a supplement company called Ephemol. Now the senior research in charge of the study, his name is listed last, David Kennedy. If you go down here at the end of the discussion section, it says DK, that's David Kennedy, has previously received funding from Ephemol, Martek, and Ginsana SA for DHA research. These are all big supplement companies that produce and sell DHA, and they all have paid this researcher, Kennedy. Kennedy coincidentally decided to apply for a grant to do this DHA study. This is a very strong signal that this is an industry-related study. This is commercial research, which isn't the same as research for scientific purposes. Now, when you look at the study on the page, it says, see corresponding editorial on page 909. And in this editorial, two professors have weighed in and noted that this is a very poorly designed study. They say, we do not know what primary endpoint was defined a priori by the study investigators. This critical information is not provided in the article, nor on the trial register. The lack of an apparently pre-specified primary outcome has resulted in the investigators reporting statistical tests on multiple cognitive function outcomes. So they're basically saying this is a bogus commercial study. If you watch my video, about the chocolate diet. I'm showing the title here. You know this is how the chocolate company researchers designed a study to show that chocolate promotes weight loss. You set up a study with no goals. Uh, you grab a lot of data over time and then you're just you know on a fishing expedition to see if you can find something positive that pops out of the data and then you say oh well this is what the study is about once you've gotten the data. You don't define anything at the outset. You just see if you can find some sort of impact in the data and then you use that in order to make a marketing claim. So this is a garbage study. I've seen this study on some websites promoting DHA, but it's an industry study that's even trashed by the journal, the editors of the journal that published it. When it comes to supplements, a conservative approach is the safest. And the conservative approach is to avoid all supplements unless you have a definite need, such as with B12, uh, if you're a healthy vegan. Supplements are not without risks. Even B12 for some people, smokers, uh, is, a, is a risk, which I'll talk about in another video sometime. When you take a supplement, you're really changing your exposure to a given nutrient. And when you flood your body with just one nutrient or just a few nutrients, you may crowd out uh, the absorption of other important nutrients and actually create an imbalance. The human body was not designed to be bombarded with single nutrients. Nutrients are supposed to be acquired from food. 
The supplement industry promotes this reductionistic view of the human body, a lot like the medical establishment does. It's the magic bullet theory that there's one drug, one supplement, one nutrient that is going to prevent disease or whatever. It's not true. And it's based on this unproven notion that you need lots and lots of nutrients, that you know you re need really good quality nutrition, and that the more nutrients, the better, the longer you'll live. But this theory is completely unproven. If you get adequate, healthy plant foods, it's unlikely that you're going to have any issue with deficiencies. The centenarians in Okinawa have been studied quite a bit because they are some of the longest lived people in the world. And many of these people live very healthy, past their hundreds, right to the end of their lives, independent. And their diet is very simple. It's a healthy dose of vegetables, of grains, of tubers, uh, with the occasional animal product thrown in. It's very low in fat. And the Okinawans do not get all their RDAs. They don't get all their recommended daily allowance that are supposedly important for health. Here's a study. This is from 2007. It's called Calorie Restriction, the Traditional Okinawan Diet and Healthy Aging, the Diet of the World's Longest Lived People and Its Potential Impact on Morbidity and Lifespan. Now, I'm not going to go into it here, but what you see in this study is that the Okinawans had nutritional deficiencies. They didn't get the RDA on several vitamins. They got way, way less. It's shown in detail that they had deficiencies and a significant number had minor symptoms of a B2 deficiency, dry, cracked lips at the corner of their mouths. So what does that tell us? That the diet of the longest lived people on the planet is a deficient diet. Uh, and it doesn't matter. You know, they still live longer than anyone else on the planet. So there are no long-lived cultures that have been studied who got excellent nutrition who, or who got, you know, all the most important superfoods or who took a bunch of supplements and lived to age 100. But that's the notion that businesses which sell supplements want you to believe. They sell this idea that supplements are necessary for longevity, that individual nutrients are absolutely critical, uh, that certain foods must be eaten to protect you. And if you don't follow their advice about nutrients, you're going to die. So that's what supplement sellers do. But it's not true. The human body is elegantly designed to thrive on just adequate nutrition. We can upregulate a lot of what we need, but too much is generally the problem with diets. You know, when what shortens your life is getting too much, not too little, too much of the wrong foods. Now, I have found over time that vitamins, minerals, and other supplements follow a kind of pattern. There's an initial high enthusiasm for a given supplement. Some preliminary studies that show promise. There's a ton of hype. Maybe a few strong personalities come forward and are pushing it like, oh, this supplement you know, does amazing things. You definitely want to buy this supplement from me. Uh, so the supplement makers crank them out and a lot of money is made. That's the first phase. The second phase is where the supplement is basically shown to be worthless, except for maybe a few extreme deficiencies, the supplement, but otherwise it's worthless. The third phase is when it comes out that the supplement is actually shown to be harmful. And at that point, the hype tends to die down. <laughs> Omega-3 supplements are now entering the third phase. The, the repeated research is suggesting that they may cause harm. The evidence is indicating pretty strongly that omega-3 supplements don't prevent heart attacks, they don't prevent cancer, uh, they don't do much for your eyes or for depression. I mean, there's a study here and there, but they don't really do anything for brain health either. So basically, omega-3 has been in the second phase where it's shown to be worthless. Here, Harvard says they didn't pan out. If you're taking them on your own because you believe they are good for you, it's time to rethink that strategy. Medical news today, it remains unclear whether consuming more fish oil and omega-3 will bring health benefits, but a diet that offers a variety of nutrients is likely to be healthful. The BBC fish oil supplements for healthy heart, nonsense. The chance of getting any meaningful benefit from taking omega-3 is 1 in 1,000. The Cochrane Library, one of the most authoritative and trusted outlets, they don't take any money, they have no conflicts, they have the highest standards. They looked at dementia and cognitive decline and omega-3 supplements. And here's the study. This was in 2012. They found the results of the available studies show no benefit for cognitive function with omega-3 supplementation among cognitively healthy older people. Then they looked at it again in 2016. And we found no convincing evidence for the efficacy of omega-3 supplements in the treatment of mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. This result was consistent for all outcomes relevant for people with dementia. 
So DHA had no impact on dementia. Here's an NIH study from 2015, but it had no impact on cognitive function in these 4,000 people over five years. So this is the second phase that we've been in for DHA. The DHA is worthless. DHA doesn't really do anything that we'd hoped it could. And now we're entering the third phase, showing that DHA can cause harm. So let's take a look at some of these studies. This one, when it came out, I saw it. This is from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research, which is a group of world-renowned scientists, including three Nobel laureates. It's a very respected cancer research organization. A high percentage of omega-3 acids in the blood is linked to an increased risk of aggressive prostate cancer. Analyzing data from nationwide study involving more than 3,400 men, researchers at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center found that men with the highest blood percentage of DHA, an inflammation-lowering omega-3 fatty acid commonly found found in fatty fish have two and a half times the risk of developing aggressive high-grade prostate cancer compared to men with the lowest DHA levels. This finding was based on blood levels of omega-3, and they also had dietary records of these people. And most of the people in this study got their omega-3 from fish, very few from supplements. So, okay, that was interesting. But then a few years later, they've been looking at the same issue. This study confirms a link between high blood levels of omega-3 fatty acids and increased risk of aggressive prostate cancer. A second large prospective study by scientists at Fred Hutchinson's Cancer Research Center has confirmed the link between high blood concentrations of omega-3 fatty acids and an increased risk of prostate cancer. Published in the online edition of the Journal of National Cancer Institute, the latest findings indicate that high concentrations of EPA, DPA, and DHA, the three anti-inflammatory and metabolically related fatty acids derived from fatty fish and fish oil supplements are associated with a 71% increased risk of high-grade prostate cancer. The study also found a 44% increase in the risk of low-grade prostate cancer and an overall 43% risk for all prostate cancers. The increase in risk for high-grade prostate cancer is important because those tumors are more likely to be fatal. This was another association study, and the DHA industry went crazy when this was published. And people who were selling vegan source DHA asserted that any increase in cancer risk was due to the fish and not due to the omega-3, that their own product wouldn't raise cancer. And a colleague of mine actually emailed the lead research, Alan Crystal, to ask that question. Uh, this was back in 2013 or 2014. Dr. Crystal replied that they did not believe that the fish source was the reason for the increase increased cancer, but that the higher blood level of DHA and EPA. And apparently there was a lot of pushback from the supplement industry at this time. Uh, DHA and EPA, they actually have their own lobby group, their own trade group, and they claimed it was the PCBs in the fish uh, and that they didn't have those PCBs in their formulation. So, you know, people got very defensive who were selling DHA at that time. But again, Dr. Crystal said there was no association seen between fish and aggressive prostate cancer. They didn't believe it was a contamination issue of any significant level. They had the dietary records on the subjects, and the same outcome was seen in the small group of people supplementing, as opposed to those getting it from fish. Uh, they, they, never published the dietary data. Here is a letter from Dr. Crystal and two other researchers who noted these earlier association studies, four studies on food with food frequency questionnaires, which are weak, and two more blood level studies showing an increase in prostate cancer with the omega-3 blood levels. And it reads, in a much larger case-controlled study nested within the European Prospective Investigation into Cancer and Nutrition, a 31% and 39% increase in prostate cancer risk in the highest compared with the lowest quintile of plasma asthma, phospholipid EPA, and DHA was seen respectively. There was a 100% increased risk of high-grade cancer contrasting the highest to lowest quintiles of EPA. In a case-controlled study nested within the prostate cancer prevention trial, which was a unique study because the presence or absence of prostate cancer was determined by biopsy for all participants, a 150 and 99% risk of high-grade prostate cancer in the highest versus the lowest quintile of serum phospholipid DHA or EPA plus DHA respectively was found, although there was no association for EPA alone. Although the findings from the prostate cancer prevention trial were based on screen-detected cancers, which identified cases that might never have become clinically relevant, the strength of the associations for high-grade cancer suggests that the findings are indeed clinically relevant. 
So there were very strong associations, especially with blood levels of DHA, but also EPA, and especially the study that used biopsy to confirm the prostate cancer. In putting this video together, I tried to contact Dr. Crystal to get an update, but he died earlier this year, unfortunately. So I spoke to Theodore Brasky, Dr. Ted Brasky, who was a lead researcher on a lot of this research, and he was actually personally involved in most of these DHA and prostate cancer studies. Dr. Brasky, he's a guy I'm going to interview. He's been out and away this week, but he's a fascinating and extremely brilliant researcher. I'll bring you that when I do it. Dr. Brasky pointed me towards a number of newer studies. This one, Plasma Phospholipid Fatty Acids and Prostate Cancer Risk in the SELECT Trial. This study confirms previous reports of increased prostate cancer risk among men with high blood concentrations of omega-3. The consistency of these findings suggests that these fatty acids are involved in prostate tumor genesis. Recommendations to increase omega-3 intake should consider its potential risks. So they're cautioning against risk of long-chain omega-3s which are EPA and DHA, and that people, like me at least, men, should consider the risk before we start trying to raise our omega-3 blood levels. This was the EPIC study. There were significant positive associations between MISRIC, alpha-linaic, and EPA, and risk of high-grade prostate cancer. Conclusion, the associations between palmetic, steric, these, these are all different fatty acids, uh, MISRIC, alpha-linaic, and EPA acids, and prostate cancer, Risk may reflect differences in intake or metabolism of these fatty acids between the precancer cases and the controls and should be explored further. So this was another study with another signal about EPA and prostate cancer. Dr. Brasky said I should take note of a large pooling project that he was part of. There have been several of these small studies that just had a few hundred people in them, but researchers at Oxford, along with Dr. Brasky, they gathered data where there was blood and prostate cancer information from different groups, and they pooled them all together to create a large population. To date, the association between circulating fatty acids and risk of prostate cancer has been examined in 10 individual prospective studies, but these have not been large enough to provide precise estimates of associations, especially by stage and grade of disease. Moreover, it's difficult to evaluate the evidence for an association of some individual fatty acids with prostate cancer risk from the published data alone, because some studies have not presented data for the full range of fatty acids measured. The Androgynous Hormones Nutritional Biomarkers and Prostate Cancer Collaborative Group was was established with the aim of reanalyzing individual data from prospective studies of the associations of circulating concentrations of hormones and nutritional biomarkers with risk of prostate cancer. And they did find, they found these, these associations. Prostate cancer risk was respectively 14 and 16% greater in the highest fifth of EPA and DPA, but in each case there was heterogeneity between studies. EPA in blood was associated with small increases in total prostate cancer risk and low-grade disease in particular. Dr. Prasky told me that his own study saw a stronger association for high-grade disease, but this is what they saw in the Oxford pool analysis. It wasn't as strong as what Dr. Brasky had found in his own research. Dr. Brasky told me that when his 2014 study was published and got some publicity, he said two things happened. One was that the omega-3 supplement business went berserk. He said he received cease and desist, desist letters from these companies, which he ignored. They don't like bad news about their products. Obviously, it's not good for business. The other thing that happened is that a woman named Joanne Mason, who is a medical doctor at Harvard, was conducting a five-year randomized trial uh, on omega-3 as well as vitamin D. It was called the VITAL study. And VITAL had 28,000 subjects, 28,000 people in it, until Dr. Brasky's study was reported in the media. And then a couple of thousand men who heard about that and were in the study decided to drop out of VITAL. They did not want to be guinea pigs who take omega-3 oil um, because of the possible prostate cancer risk. So Dr. Brasky said that Dr. Mason at Harvard was not pleased with him at all when she lost a couple of thousand uh, study participants. So it looks like the men who dropped out of the vital study did the right thing, or at least if they had been in the omega-3 group, and that's because the vital study, which was published in January of this year, it showed a 13% elevated total cancer risk in men who had been randomized into the omega-3 oil group versus those getting the placebo. The 13% increased risk was statistically significant uh, because of the confidence interval. And vital study also showed a 15% elevated risk for prostate cancer in the omega-3 group, but this was statistically non-significant. It was just 094 
and although that's pretty close to 1.0, which would have made it significant, Dr. Brasky wondered to me in our interview whether it would have been significant had there been more steady subjects or if the study had gone on longer than just the five years. He said that the results of his own papers and the EPIC cohort and the Oxford pooled analysis, he thinks it's possible. The evidence is pointing toward prostate cancer and omega-3 oil and other cancers in men. Now, just to be clear, Dr. Brasky says he is not saying that he has concluded ultimately that long chain omega-3 fatty acids are harmful. He has said that the best conclusion currently is that they are harmful uh, and the alternative explanations aren't as strong, like you know maybe there was detection bias in all these studies, but then there are studies where men received a biopsy at the end of the study, so the detection bias is not an issue in those studies. And in the vital study, uh, all the men were randomized to uh, you know, fish oil or the placebo, so he doesn't think there's risk of bias there either, at least not very much. So, and I asked him, what might the mechanism be uh, for this cancer from omega-3? And he said, it's still not clear, and which that should be a strike against any hypothesis of harm from omega-3. But then it doesn't mean that it can't be harmful, just that it may be more, compli more complicated what the mechanism is. I mentioned how sellers of vegan DHA uh, had claimed that it must have been the fish source or PCBs or impurities. And this was Dr. Brasky's response. He said, people are absolutely welcome to data-free hypothesis. We measured blood level in three studies and could not possibly assess for those attaining omega-3 from supplements, the specific source. Do I think the source really matters? Not really. There remains no clear evidence that other ingredients in fish specifically are a culprit here, should the associations we've seen turn out to be true. Heavy metals and PCBs are not linked to prostate cancer, at least at this point. In talking about targeting omega-3 for prevention of diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Dr. Brasky said, the main issue we are discussing is marketing of a supplement to a specific group. Marketing doesn't actually involved honest evaluation of science. In fact, when I was at the GOED, that's a global organization for EPA and DPA, that's a lobbying group. When I was at the GOED annual conference defending our select paper, I was privy to a few interesting presentations on how scientific findings can be used to market supplements. Willful misinterpretation of oftentimes flimsy results are pretty much the name of the game. Let's not forget the massive conflicts of interest in some of the studies that are supported by the very manufacturers who are hawking their products. So Dr. Brasky's message is the same of, as mine. Stay away from supplement sellers to get your information. They are not dedicated to truth, but to money. So for men, there is an element of Russian roulette when you're thinking about taking an omega-3 uh, supplement. You have to ask yourself, is the possible increased risk of cancer worth the theoretical, unproven, and marketing exaggerated benefit uh, that you possibly could get from a DHA supplement? Now let's look at what leading conventional medical and scientific organizations say about whether they recommend DHA. The National Institutes of Health, they say no. They have this page, they talk about the bottom line, no benefit for heart disease, high doses can lower triglycerides, might help arthritis symptoms, does not slow age-related macular degeneration. And it says, for most other conditions for which omega-3 supplements have been studied, the evidence is inconclusive or doesn't indicate that omega-3s are beneficial. Then it mentions side effect, there's conflicting evidence on whether omega-3s might influence the risk of prostate cancer. Well, Dr. Brasky doesn't really believe that the evidence is conflicting. Let's look at a study that conflicts. This was called Meta-Analysis of Long-Chain Omega-3 Polyfatty Acids and Prostate Cancer. So this is a meta-analysis and it concluded, the results from this meta-analysis do not support an association between omega-3 and prostate cancer. So the researchers here, they don't believe there's any association. Now let's see who funded this study. This work was supported by the Global Organization for EPA and DHA, G-O-E-D. Okay, this is the organization that Dr. Brasky talked about where that he went to, a commercial organization. So it was paid for by this organization. This is their website. It's an EPA and DHA industry trade company. And it notes that the researchers, Dr. Harris, Weed, Bassett, Barrett, did not receive funding from G-O-E-D. So who did pay them? Well, it turns out they were paid 
for by a professional science, a company of professional science consultants called Exponent. And this is their website. Their job is to solve engineering, science, regulatory, and business issues facing our clients. So this is one of those contract research organization companies that you can hire to get study results to support your product and support your company. Professor Marion Nessel, who I interviewed, uh, you can listen to that interview. She talked about these kinds of companies and that interview there, they, you can hire them to you set up a study and run a study and they will do the entire study for you and they will generally get you the result that you want. So this conflicting evidence, this is something that you have to look at very carefully because it's commercial science, it's junk science, it's not real research, it's trying to cloud the question uh, on cancer and DHA. Okay, let's look at this study that Dr. Greger uses to suggest that his followers should take DHA. He goes through and reviews some things until he finally finds the study that brings it all home and makes him realize that, yes, we need DHA. The only thing one would need now to prove cause and effect is a randomized controlled trial showing we can actually slow brain loss by giving people extra long-chain omega-3s, but the trials to date show no cognitive benefits from supplementation until now. Double-blind, randomized, interventional study providing evidence for the first time that extra long-chain omega-3s exert positive effects on brain functions in healthy older adults. This study is the centerpiece of Dr. Greger's video and his recommendation of DHA. This is the one that, you know, until now, we didn't think, now this proves that we need DHA, according to Dr. Greger. And the name of this study is Long-Chain Omega-3 Fatty Acids Improve Brain Function and Structure in Older Adults. Now, this is a very small, very preliminary study that took 65 women, split them into two groups, gave one group fish oil pills, and the other got a placebo, and it ran for 26 weeks, which is, what, six months. There were some changes observed, but by no means is anything earth-shattering or hugely significant um, that the entire viewership of Nutrition Facts needs to drop everything, forget about cancer risk, and jump on the DHA bandwagon. Not at all. Let's look at this study a little. It says, exclusion criteria were severe disease, including diabetes, type 2, neurological disorders, psychiatric medication, a mini mental state examination, a body mass under 25 kilograms per meter squared, intake of acetic acid, daily consumption of up to 50 grams of alcohol, up to 10 cigarettes, up to six cups of coffee. So this is a group of 65 overweight women who could smoke nine cigarettes a day. Uh, they had a BMI of 28, body fat of 30%. That's a fair amount of body fat. This is not a health-oriented group of women. Uh, results from this group of women and their health and their habits don't really apply to healthy people like us who are eating a diet where we're getting plenty of ALA or omega-3 from plants. It says, in addition, we observed an increase in BDNF at post-intervention measurements in both the placebo and omega-3 group, as well as a decrease in TNF, which may be due to potential changes in lifestyle habits, such as diet or exercise in both groups. Even though nutrition records and detailed questionnaires at baseline and follow-up did not actually show significant changes in lifestyle habits in our subjects, Lifestyle measures were only based on self-reported information and may thus be over or under estimations. This BDNF, which is a brain chemical that's affected by healthy eating or exercise, was raised in both groups by the end of the study period. This may be due to lifestyle habit change, such as diet or exercise, they say in the study, that took place after the study started. So these are some questions that are raised in this study. Why didn't they control for exercise or diet? You know, were there changes? Apparently there were. Where is the detailed dietary analysis, analysis that we can look at to see? Well, it appears there isn't any. There's an appendix, but they don't have any dietary information. We can see that the placebo group exercised a lot less and had higher cholesterol than the group that got the fish oil. So the people that got the fish oil were somewhat healthier. They mention changes in lifestyle habits after the study started, but they don't say really what they are, and they admit that it could be an inaccurate because it's all self-reported. So there is no detailed questionnaire supplied here. There's nothing in the appendix to give us further information. Uh, we can't know what these significant changes in lifestyle and diet were because they're not giving anything for us to evaluate. It looks like they took a small group of overweight, marginally healthy women eating a poor diet, they gave them a supplement, and apparently some women in both groups changed their diet and lifestyle during the study. The fish oil group showed some improvements. 
This is kind of reminiscent of these nut studies. This is quite weak and all over the place. Is it possible Dr. Greger has based his entire recommendation that every vegan should take a DHA supplement for the rest of their life on this one study of 65 women? Having sufficient long-chain omega-3s, EPA and DHA, may be important for preserving brain function and structure. So the next question becomes, what's sufficient, and how do you get there? Basically, this study has sealed the deal for Dr. Greger that this decides it, that we all, all we have to do is how much DHA we all should be taking every day. And he ends up concluding that everyone should take 250 milligrams total of DHA and EPA a day. But let's look at the study. The study says the omega-3 group received fish oil capsules for 26 weeks comprising 2,200 milligrams, 1,320 of EPA and 880 of DHA given as fish oil. So these women in the study, they took 2,200 milligrams of DHA and EPA a day in order to get whatever benefits they may have gotten. But Dr. Greger is only advising 250 milligrams. Why would Dr. Greger look at a study of women taking 2,200 milligrams of omega-3 and decide that it's an important study and then conclude that his viewers should take, oh, about 90% less omega-3 than what we saw in this study, only 250 milligrams a day? What is his logic here? If this study is valid and earth-shattering, shouldn't he be telling everyone to take 2,200 milligrams of omega-3 a day, like the women in this study? Why is Dr. Greger extrapolating that a study supposedly showing a benefit at 2,200 milligrams means that his viewers should only take 250 milligrams? It seems to me that Dr. Greger is not really evaluating this study properly. The other problem is, and this is what the Harvard neurologist mentioned to me that I'm going to talk about, you can't look at the benefit that someone gets from one formulation, like fish oil, and then just assume that someone taking DHA derived from another source will have the same impact. Formulation means a lot, and you would have to test a new formulation to know whether it would work or not. So Dr. Furman's DHA, for example, has never been shown to have the same impact at, as the formulations in these studies. You cannot assume that it would do the same thing according to this Harvard neurologist that I'm going to talk about in a minute. So you can't extrapolate fish oil to algae. Uh, and as I say, Dr. Greger here is telling people to take 90% less uh, omega-3 than they used in this study, which he is playing up as if it's some major breakthrough. So according to Dr. Greger, this study of 65 women from, what, six years ago for 26 weeks, that this trumps the study of 4,000 people over five years that the NIH did, which showed no benefit. This study is extremely preliminary. Uh, it's a one-off on a small number of people. As I say, much larger studies on more people and more time have found no impact on cognitive function. This is the level of speculation and poor science that Dr. Greger's followers are relying on if they decide to add an omega-3 supplement that raises men's risk of cancer apparently by 13%. This is a poorly done, non-repeated study on a small number of women which is really irrelevant to healthy people that are eating a healthy plant-based diet. I mean, it's possible if you take some group of unhealthy people and you give them some supplement, uh, and that some people in that group who are low in that, you know, maybe those people will get some benefit. But that doesn't mean that it's healthy, and that doesn't mean that everyone else would benefit from it. In no way can a 26-week study of 65 unhealthy, overweight women be extrapolated to the entire vegan population or any population. You know, that we should all be taking DHA for the rest of our lives, as Dr. Uh, Greger is, you know, advocating based on this study. I think it's irresponsible to make a recommendation like that based on this evidence. And it's worth noting that Dr. Greger has a conflict of interest with regards to the DHA, to DHA that he's failed to disclose. He is Joel Furman's partner. Dr. Greger is a partner of Dr. Furman. You can see that he is listed over here as a partner with the DHA research arm of Dr. Furman's business. And the dose of omega-3 that uh, Dr. Greger is recommending just happens to be the dose of Dr. Furman's DHA that he sells, 250 milligrams. Is that a connection here? I don't know what the nature of the partnership is between Dr. Greger and Dr. Furman that's listed here on the website. Maybe one, one of them donates to the other, gives money to the other. I don't know. That's, we're, that's not disclosed. But I do believe that Dr. Greger should disclose when he's recommending a supplement that he's a partner to a business that's you know, set up to market that supplement, and that he, if he has some kind of interest in these affairs 
uh, the supplement issue of, uh, of Dr. Furman. I do, I find it troubling that he's not revealing his conflict. And this is a habit shared by Dr. Furman. The Furman operation has a great reluctance to disclose conflicts, as you've seen in my other videos on the subject. And of course, if there really were some worthwhile result uh, from this study of 65 unhealthy women, and they used fish oil, and not the same product Dr. Furman is selling. So there's nothing to indicate that Dr. Furman's product would give the same benefit. I would not rely on weak, flimsy research like this to start spending money on a supplement every day for the rest of your life and potentially put your health at risk from one silly study. The, pr the burden of proof is on Dr. Greger to show that this supplement is necessary and that it will unquestionably provide some benefit and no harm. But this one poor study does not meet that standard. If I was some, if it was some, you know, kind of revolutionary or landmark study on 65 women, I'm sure that the Alzheimer's Association and the, and the dementia associations who, who have tons of research ability, they would be all over this. But this is a one-off, strange, little, poorly done study from six years ago. It may be impressive to supplement sellers. It's not impressive to real researchers. Here's a study from 2018. It's called Brain Health Across the Lifespan, a Systematic Review of the Role of Omega-3 Fatty Acid Supplements. It's a meta-analysis. They looked at 25 randomized controlled trials, and they found that subsequently, these DHA appear to benefit those with lower baseline fatty acid levels who are breastfeeding or who have neuropsychiatric conditions. So they're saying the only people who appeared to benefit in these 25 randomized controlled trials of fish oil were women who were breastfeeding or people with neuropsychiatric conditions. So maybe omega-3 is like other nutrients. If someone is seriously deficient, you know, for that very small group of people, then improving their status through food or through pills, you know, that might help. But by no means does that mean that the entire population should be doing that. There's no standardized tests or measurements for omega-3 other than those made by researchers working for the interests of the supplement makers. By, by changing your, your omega-3 number by a point or two, does that mean anything? Does that necessarily equate to health? Where are the long-term endpoint studies? Where are the studies of some thousands of people for 5, 10, or 20 years taking DHA and then seeing that they got some sort of benefit or that they didn't get harm, they didn't get a disease, or they didn't die of prostate cancer? The, this DHA scam is just empty promises. It's 100% speculation based on weak preliminary short-term studies. And this is amateur hour in the vegan online world. A bunch of pigeons being lined up to be fleeced by the DHA sellers month in and month out, being scared into taking an unproven, unneeded supplement to make money for somebody. It could very well be that DHA is like HDL. HDL is the good cholesterol, and for years, researchers tried to find ways to raise HDL. They tried diet and alcohol and exercise and medications, and it ended up not mattering. Getting your LDL low, that matters, but it doesn't really matter where your HDL is. So DHA could be like HDL. It's really not relevant, and just raising it is pointless. You know, there's no real benefit for the vast majority, and it could be dangerous. So it's sad to see people basically being duped with this kind of simplistic nonsense. I interviewed Dr. David Simon, professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. He's the director of Parkinson's disease and movement disorders at the center at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. This is a very renowned researcher in Parkinson's. Uh, I was very lucky to be able to communicate with him. I asked him about the use of DHA for the prevention or treatment of Parkinson's disease. Here's what he said. There have been a couple of small placebo-controlled clinical trials suggesting that omega-3 fatty acid supplements may have some clinical benefits in Parkinson's patients, but the studies are of limited duration and with relatively low number of patients. I don't consider this to be definitive. The data do look promising and further study is warranted. I sent Dr. Simon a link to Dr. Joel Furman's DHA page that discusses Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and the importance of DHA for prevention, Dr. Simon replied, this web page in your link below appears more like a biased sales pitch rather than an objective and critical review of the pros and cons of the data. I'm not aware of any clinical data showing that taking a fish oil supplement will actually reduce a person's risk of later developing Parkinson's disease. Theoretical benefits and demonstration of benefits in animal models is not sufficient. 
Other supplements that have passed those tests have subsequently been shown to have no benefits in large placebo-controlled phase 3 clinical studies in Parkinson's disease patients, such as coenzyme Q10, creatine. So the bottom line is that there are promising but not definitive data on fish oil supplements. There's reason for hope and for further study, but it goes beyond existing data to say it's been proven to prevent or slow Parkinson's disease. So Professor Simon is giving his opinion that Dr. Furman's DHA page is biased, that it looks like a sales pitch and this is the reason that you don't want to go get information from supplement sales websites people that are selling them i asked further about fish oil versus dha uh, you know the dha that is being sold by dr Furman, for example is algae derived and here's what dr simon responded this is an important point but it doesn't substantially change my answer it's an issue when deciding if a particular supplement such as the one they are promoting is useful you raise one additional caveat that the specific preparation might be important, so we can't be sure that data using one preparation may apply to a different source of a similar but not identical agent. There are data suggesting possible health benefits from eating fish in general. I'm not talking about Parkinson's disease specifically here, but the same health benefits have not always been found when studying a fish oil supplement. I'm generally more in favor of encouraging a healthy diet rather than taking supplements. I also consulted with uh, Robert Hauser, Dr. Hauser, who's a professor of neurology and the director of the USF Health Birds Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorders Center. Dr. Hauser has co-authored over 100 peer-reviewed publications on, on Parkinson's. He currently serves as a lead investigator and member of the steering committee for multiple national and international clinical trials. He lectures frequently in scientific meetings. He's been the chair of uh, Congress on Parkinson's and so on. Dr. Hauser is one of the preeminent Parkinson's researchers in the world. This was his comment. DHA has been seen to be, quote, beneficial in several animal models of Parkinson's disease. Therefore, it is of scientific interest. However, I am not aware of any study of Parkinson's disease patients in which DHA has been shown to be of benefit or adequately tested. Every single agent that looked promising in the lab for Parkinson's turned out to be worthless when actually tested in people. Now I want to take a quick look at two reviews on dementia and Alzheimer's from top researchers and what the latest information exists out there. This one is called Prevention of Dementia. It does mention omega-3. It says randomized trials to date have not shown a benefit to cognitive function and have lacked power and duration to test whether omega-3 consumption reduces incident dementia. A meta-analysis of three trials that studied the impact of omega-3 supplementation on cognitive performance found no effective treatment after six or to 40 months of supplementation. Subsequent to this review, other trials have also found no benefit, including a trial in 4,000 older adults at risk for macular degeneration that found no effective fish oil supplementation and or lutein in composite cognitive function scores over a five-year period. Here's another review, uh, Epidemiology, Pathology, and Pathogenesis of Alzheimer's Disease. This article is important because like on the Parkinson's article on pathogenesis and cause, there is no mention anywhere of fatty acid deficiency or veganism being a cause of dementia. This is not an oversight because of a bias against, you know, natural supplements. Lots of supplements have been looked at to see if there's any relationship uh, as being a potential cause in the case of deficiency or potentially being helpful as a preventative treatment. There's no guidelines on dementia or Parkinson's, not even a mention of DHA that could possibly be helpful in here. Dr. Furman has been saying since at least 2005 that he's seen, you know, lots of elderly vegans with Parkinson's and low DHA. But in all that time, he has never submitted a case report to a legitimate journal, such as a neurology journal. Case reports, they're anecdotes. They are extremely weak evidence, but he hasn't even done that. So, you know, in short, I don't believe Dr. Furman when he claims that his office has been flooded with, you know, vegans who all have Parkinson's. I think this is pure fluffery to sell DHA. He writes articles on his website that are supposed to count as, you know, some sort of proof. But again, find me a single Parkinson's specialist anywhere in the world who checks DHA levels uh, in his patients or, you know, who advises those patients to take a DHA supplement for prevention. A family doctor Joel Furman, who is not a specialist in neurology, you know, who happens to make money selling DHA, he is the guy that came up with this idea of, about Parkinson's and DHA. Now let's look at omega-3 and vegans. And remember, the main concern is whether healthy vegans are converting enough omega-3, ALA, into EPA and DHA. This study showed that the conversion rate in vegans is twice that of a fish eater. 
The study is called Dietary Intake and Status of Omega-3 Polyunsaturated Fatty Acids in Populations of Fish-Eating and Non-Fish-Eating Meat-Eaters, Vegetarians, and Vegans, and the Precursor Product Ratio of ALA to Long-Chain Omega-3 Polyunsaturated Fatty Acids, Results of the Epic Norfolk Cohort. It says comparison of the plasma long chain omega 3s, this means dietary ALA ratio between dietary habit groups showed that it was 209% higher in vegan men and 184% higher in vegan women than in fish eaters. It was 14% higher in vegetarian men and 6% higher in vegetarian women than fish eaters and was 17 and 18% higher in male and female meat eaters respectively than fish eaters. This suggests that statistically estimated conversion may be higher in non-fish eaters than in fish eaters. They were looking at how much each of these groups were taking in as ALA and how much EPA and DHA resulted in their blood. And the vegans had higher, meaning the conversion rate in vegans had to be higher because they had a lower intake. So in other words, your body adapts when you're taking in less omega-3 and upregulates to convert more dietary ALA if you're not getting enough through diet, like if you're not eating fish. So if you're eating a lot of fish, your body doesn't need to do much conversion. So our bodies are pretty smart. This part is interesting. The major source of ALA in the whole population were the cereals and vegetable food groups, 42% of ALA, with total fish contributing 12% to intake and total meat contributing 13% to intake in men and 12% of intake in women. Cereals and vegetables supplied 63% intake in vegetarians, 63% men, 73% women in vegans, and 44% men, 47 women in meat eaters. So when we look at where ALA is coming from in the general population, where we're consuming it from, from. We're not getting it for fish or nuts. Even fish eaters aren't getting it. We're getting it most from cereals and vegetables, grains and vegetables. If you're eating enough of those and you're not getting too much fat or too much omega-6, your body can convert the ALA to DHA and EPA and you're good. Here's another study. It showed that despite a theoretical low conversion rate of DHA in vegetarians, there's no evidence of any harm. So the problem may not be the conversion rate, but in the assumption that it's low. There's no evidence of adverse effects on health or cognitive function with lower DHA intake in vegetarians. In the absence of convincing evidence for the deleterious effects resulting from the lack of DHA from the diet of vegetarians, it must be concluded that the needs for omega-3 fatty acids can be met by dietary ALA. They also note in here the importance of limiting excess omega-6s, especially in vegans and vegetarians, as they had higher intakes than the omnivores. Vegetarian and especially vegan diets supply more linoleic acid than omnivore diets. So they're probably eating too much oil and nuts, you know, the vegetarians and the vegans. So they're getting too much omega-6 than, you know, than the, than the non-vegetarian group. So DHA is not a problem in vegetarians and vegans. If it were, humans might have died out, you know, eons ago. But we get plenty of what we need from a healthy diet, if you want to increase your omega-3, just lower your fat intake, especially bad fats and omega-6s, um, and add some flax meal to your diet. It, it doesn't take much. A tablespoon, you know, is about, which is about 38 calories, that supplies an adequate intake in your set. Um, Dr. Furman is like many supplement sellers. His claims for various products, they change as the times change. For example, in 2012, he sold his LDL Protect and stated that it protected against dementia, strokes, and cancer, and also reduces atherosclerosis. Okay, this is pages from 2012. It's in the archive.org Wayback Machine. Let's look at the same product in 2019. It seems that the product now doesn't do any of these things. He, Dr. Furman lists no claims for the product. So what changed? Were his earlier claims incorrect? That LDL Protect pre prevented dementia, strokes, and cancers? Do you see what happens here? What will his claims be for DHA in two years? Right now, it says he says that it prevents Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, supposedly. In, 2022, uh, will he have that change that, you know, DHA prevents wrinkles or it cures baldness? You know, will there be no claims for DHA just like his LDL product today? So uh, the supplement business is a moving target. You you're constantly changing the goalposts and the definitions when you can no longer get away with a claim. So you make a new claim and you keep trying to push that supplement on people. Do you remember Nani Juice? It was all the rage for a while. I've never seen anything like it. It's called the Noni Fruit. And I want to put it on your radar because of its potent anti-aging properties that can help you look younger and live longer too. Nani juice turned out to be a bust. 
WebMD says the effectiveness of Nani for these uses has not been proven. It notes that the FDA has issued multiple warnings to Nani manufacturers about health claims that aren't backed up by fact. It also lists warnings. There is concern that taking Nani in medicinal amounts is possibly unsafe. Nani tea or juice might cause liver damage in some people. There are several reports of liver damage in people who drank Nani tea or juice for several weeks. And it notes that Nani has been linked to kidney and liver damage. Here's Dr. Weil's site. He says the most damage Nani juice is likely to inflict is to your bank account. So essentially the craze for Nani juice was driven by money. It was part of a multi-level marketing or pyramid scheme where people could earn a lot of money by getting their friends and followers you know, to, to take it. They could get a cut. You could get a cut from the sales. I know someone who was selling Nani juice. Here's what went out on a mailing list, list by this person about Nani juice in 1998. I started using Tahitian Nani juice with my patients and never have I seen a product so effective for so many different conditions. To my amazement, Nani juice offered relief in the majority of cases for many different conditions. Almost every patient reported pain relief from multiskeletal symptoms. It worked remarkably well for degenerative joint disease, autoimmune illnesses like rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, and even garden variety back pain. Wow, it sounds almost as good as DHA, doesn't it? My father has chronic lymphocytic leukemia with steadily worsening anemia and climbing white blood cell count. After just two weeks on Nani juice, his anemia improved and his white count dropped from 115 to 76. Not only that, my father had suffered severe ankle injuries during World War II. After only five days of being on Nani, he could dance pain-free after being in pain for years. When the fat melts off your body, it'll stay off. Other physicians, including Stephen Hall, MD, corroborated my findings with their patients as well. Dr. Hall told me 10 years of chronic back pain gone within three weeks of starting this juice. 23 years of menstrual headaches gone after taking Tahitian Nani. A 40-year-old female who suffered a stroke after spinal disc surgery resolved her lid lag, vision, and limb pain within three weeks of starting Nani juice. I urge all health professionals to try Tahitian Nani juice on themselves and their patients. I'm convinced it could make a significant difference in most people's health. And if you haven't guessed it, yes, Dr. Furman was the person who wrote that to push the miracle Nani juice to everybody he could, just as he sells the miracle DHA today. Follow the money. Dr. Furman seems to have a history of pushing questionable products and they're pushed as, you know, critical for your good health until it turns out that they might be dangerous. We need to put an end to this DHA mythology. DHA is just the next Nani juice. Okay, please post your comments down there in the comments section. Post links to studies that you want me to look at. Uh, I'm going to make another video using your questions and comments and links. And we've done a little bit of troll harvesting here on my YouTube channel and cleared away a few characters. And I can really see that there are a lot of really intelligent people on my channel who are ready to have some in-depth conversations with each other. And I really appreciate you guys being here and having a chance to interact with you. So thank you for showing up. I look forward to chatting in the comments. Please hit like if you like this video. Please subscribe so you'll know when I have a new one. I'll see you on the next one. Thanks a lot.